Welcome to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere with your host, Chris Parker. And welcome back to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere. This is Chris Parker, and this is part of the family series. So I have Chris Hubbard, who just told me that he should not be referred to as an erotic chef because that doesn't quite explain what he does. And I'm really looking forward to getting deep into what he does. I have been at his location, well, a couple times, but one time as, with, as part of a family reunion. And there mm-hmm. we had a l- love, amazing dinner. Um, and that was th- not the normal atmosphere that he usually stages for his guests. Um, it's truly, truly tr- not. Truly not. So, and, um, but there was enough in the conversation and there's enough around the location that has just forever perked my curiosity. And uh, I would love to, at some point after the pandemic, and if the events continue to join one of those dining experiences. So Chris Hubbard, what is it that you do and why do you do what you do? Uh, I produce and host erotic dining experiences. And why? Because um, they're just so much fucking fun. It, it's, I've been privileged to have a, a lot of life experiences, done a lot of really fun, crazy stuff. Uh, but this is... It's a kind of fun that sticks with people for, for years. Um, the, the, I get to see people smiling in ways that you know the smiles and stay on their face for a long, long time. Hmm. And um, it's not a. I get to touch people in ways through food and dining that ordinarily I would only get to do through a bunker. Mm-hmm. And that's spectacular to me. The legend has it, or at least what I've read about it, this started about 10, 11 years ago in Paris as, no. a, as a thank you gift or something like that. So, How, what's so, the origin story here? So you've got some of the details kind of conflated, which is fine. Um, my wife and I were flown to Paris where I was going, where I was to be the matron of honor at a wedding. Because uh, I was part of the bride's party, not the groom's party. And he already had a best man, so I was the matron of honor. I wore a skirt. <laughs> um, some people would call it a kilt, but it was technically a skirt, so I call it a skirt. Mm-hmm. And we were hosted with considerable style in downtown Paris for 10 days. It was stunning. Uh, the wedding itself was horrifically dull. But um, it was fun getting dressed up and hanging out with friends and gallivanting through the streets of Paris, mm-hmm. uh, getting stopped by Parisians think, asking if I was a clothing designer, which was funny as hell to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when we got back to the States after the wedding, we were trying to think of how we would say thank you for basically the gift of being hosted in Paris for two weeks, mm-hmm. almost two weeks. And there was a fairly decent list of things we knew they liked. We tried to assemble them, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And one of the things they liked was boobs. Another thing they liked was wine. Another thing they liked was food. But we're like, that kind of fits together in a way that you can't get anywhere else. So we did a dinner for them, and we got a bunch of our friends over, friends with boobs over, and we dressed them up like French maids and... At the time, we were living in a house that had a front room, like a parlor, and then a kitchen down a narrow hall in the back of the, of the house. So I was in there cooking away for hours. And everyone else was up front having a grand old time with boobs, wine, and food. And it, I didn't really know what I was doing as a chef or event planner. I had done some cooking a little bit, but I was not a chef. I, any measure 
but everyone there had fun. Uh, when the couple left and all the all of our friends were had been servers were sitting around the kitchen eating the leftovers because there was lots and lots of leftovers. Uh, they all just kind of looked at me and said, that was fun. Let's do that again. I was like, no, <laughs> let's not do that again. That was a new form of living hell mm. for me because I did, I had no idea what I was doing. And mm. Portion control was off and temperature. I couldn't get the temperature of the ingredients right. And like, it was just so much work. Oh my God. The stress. How do you do lobster tail and a sauce and a, and sides and plate and get it out while it's still warm? I I was a programmer. I didn't know any of this stuff. But um, they, for the next two months or so, kept like, so how about doing that event again? And eventually I said, okay, yes, if you can get 20 guests. So one of them made one phone call and got 20 guests. <laughs> one phone call. What was the magic phone call? Was that she, like called, a- she called a guy she knew and she said, here's this event we want to do. I need 20 guests. He's like, well, I'm in a room with 20 people right now. Hold on a second. And you, know, you can hear them in the background. Everyone's like, oh, absolutely. Breast, wine, and food? Absolutely. When? And, I was like, oh, God. and that's where it started. And could this exist anywhere outside of San Francisco, do you think? Or is this, is this just a, 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 it's been going on for 10 years, at least before the pandemic. Is this just a certain way the moons are aligned for that, that, <laughs> that space to allow this energy to happen? Or is this something that, because I can imagine it's just a universal truth that boom, boobs, wine, and food is a, uh, you know, something that people can appreciate. I, I hope it's universal. Uh, we've had people from all over the world, not all over the world, but from lots of places. Um, we'll just, obviously, logistically, there's nothing that would prevent it from happening anywhere else. Um, San Francisco does have a history of doing something like this back in the gold rush days, where some of the big mansions had uh, private carriageway entrances and rich people would ride in on these private carriages and then the gates would be closed behind and then they'd be whisked into these mansions where there'd be root parlors full of wine women and song so there's there's some vague i'm not trying to maintain that tradition because that's well that's prostitution (laughs) that's not not what i wanted to do um but anyway you you know there are Events that are vaguely similar uh, that I've heard about happening in uh, the uh, southern coast of France, Côte d'Azur. Uh, but those are more like sex parties. Hmm. Uh, these erotic events weren't about sex. They were about foreplay. Hmm. And yes, there's a blur. There's a gray zone between those two things. So I, I have to challenge this foreplay thing a little bit because as I've read in the articles and I, and I can actually see in the room behind you, you have this giant metallic cock yes. that is prominently involved in the, you know, in the experience. So yes. h- how, can, how do you explain that, that huge cock as being only foreplay? <laughs> When we set the table, and we set it as a as a king's table, so all the table is one big table. Everyone sits at one large table, and the tables are organized in such a way that there's a center focus point. So they're basically like a U shape or a C shape, mm-hmm. and the servers perform in various ways uh, in the in the center. Uh, so the cock is on the center, the rooster is on the center of the, of that setup of the t- of the first center table. And it's, I get to say things like, I have an 18 inch bronze cock. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> As I do. Uh, for the first few years, we didn't have a centerpiece for the table, and the table needed one. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that at a 
antique shop that specialized in French antiques. I was like, I have to, that, that's, I found my centerpiece. I showed it to, I showed it to my wife, Beth, and she was like, yep, that's, that's the centerpiece. That one makes sense. Uh, A lot of people would, a lot of women would take off their bras and hang the bra, their bras on my cock. (laughs) That one. (laughs) Uh-huh. I was I was in the kitchen cooking, so it's like you know, leave me the fuck alone. Uh, but it's one of the other funny jokes is I get to say that I my cock has had more play than I have. <laughs> that one. That one. Um, yeah. So those, those that are listening via audio and probably a bit confused, there is this ginormous you know, bronze rooster on the shelf mm-hmm. behind him. So if you want to pop over to the video at some point or just give him a p- call and I'm sure he will send you a pic of his cock. And uh, yeah, I, it's a rooster pic, but yeah. it is 18, it is 18 inches long and it is yeah. made out of bronze. Yeah. It is, it is a beautiful antique statue. What I love about all of this, and, and I'm going to ask you to give us, not not give away all of the, the secrets of the event, but just give us a brief walkthrough on what someone could expect. And and oftentimes what, what I have read is that this is oftentimes for couples, a couple, you know, it's a big couples thing and friends <laughs> and things like that. Um, I love that how it is sort of playing with that taboo, meaning, meaning, um, you're, you're taking these things which are are enticing and 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 um, sort of sort of sparkling of of the dangerous or the or the the, the not allowed, but then you're you're mm-hmm. creating it in a space which is which is safe and approachable and 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 fun and lighthearted, and uh, and that's what I just pick up from from all of this. So, can can you walk us through um, just the highlights of of what an erotic dining experience would be like? Sure. Um, there are three main event types that we've done. Uh, the first two are called the introductory dinner and the second one with introductory and then intermediate dinners. And that's not a progression. That just happens to be an unfortunate naming. Uh, you don't have to have done the introductory dinner to do the intermediate. And then we do a private dinner after that. And private dinners don't have a playbook, whereas the first two do. The introductory dinner is the one we did most frequently. It was kind of the cash cow. Not that there was any real cash, but it was the one that kind of kept this thing going. And it was basically six to eight courses of food, depending on how you count the courses. Um, The guests would arrive, we'd greet them at the door, uh, the greeter is wearing our version of a French maid's outfit with a mask on. Guests can come dressed any way they want. Um, we ask them to be at least marginally dressed. Uh, most people dress business casual. Some of the women dress much more um, seductively, like outfits that they have in private, but they don't have a public form to wear them in uh, occasionally people would come in fetish wear it's again it's one of the few places where it would be fine to do that um, we greet them uh, if they're doing wine pairings we give them a glass of champagne and then there's a place in the room it's a large room it's a very large room like 2,000 square feet kind of large room so in one third of the room is kind of sequestered off as a, a place where they can wait and meet each other. And we serve hors d'oeuvres or appetizers while they're there. Once we have roughly 75% of the guests, and guests are typically quite punctual. Once we have 75% of the guests, we start to seat them. The, and then the dinner actually like kicks into full gear. We start with soup, and then we have uh, a mousse bouche, and then a salad, and then a true maman, and then main course, and then sometimes a pre-dessert, and then a dessert. And as dinner progresses from course to course, the servers slowly disrobe each other from the waist up in in the room. Um, and in traditional haute cuisine dining, uh, 
service is fairly stiff. It's fairly reserved. Uh, <laughs> we were <laughs> we were not reserved. Uh, one of the way so I would give the list of courses to the servers. The servers arrive a couple hours beforehand to get ready, you know, shower, shave, and do their makeup, that kind of stuff. I'd give the list of courses to the servers, and the servers would negotiate with them themselves how they wanted to serve the dinner. So sometimes they want to serve the soup kind of like over the guest's head. So you, you know, it you know, terrified me every time we did this. You know, don't spill the soup, you know, but bring in the soup down. Uh, sometimes, depending on who's who's serving, because the, the servers changed fairly frequently, um, they would want to quite climb underneath the table and come up from underneath the table with the, with the course. Um, it's just, sometimes they'd want to sit, like, on the edge of the table and feed the server. The table is are custom made and they'll support eight adults without flexing. They're very, very beefy and beautiful tables. Um, so they're designed for being able have to- you, Have you tested this eight person on the table theory? Mm -hmm. And it stood up to the pressure? Eight adults, yeah, eight adults. And yeah. They didn't, it's the legs and the frame underneath the tabletop is two inch steel tubing. And it's, you know, it, it, you could probably, the guy who built it said you could probably um, put a car up there. That the, how I did, had it designed was beefier than the rack he uses to change out engines in his cars. Mm. <laughs> so, but, safety you know, first. Beautiful. Yeah. Safety first. Yeah. Everything is about being safe first. Yeah, make sure the safety is in place and then you can have fun after that. Um, so the servers would increase the amount of and intensity of interaction they have with the guests with each course, and they would remove articles of clothing uh, if they wanted to, and almost always they wanted to. Nobody, none of the servers ever got in trouble for not removing clothing. Like if they didn't want to, that's fine. Uh, guests were never asked to remove clothing if they wanted to. That was fine. Uh, so basically, the the message I was trying to convey is you can do anything you want here in the space as long as it's above the waist and as long as the other people consent. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one, when somebody came in as a server for the first time, I would say I have, a couple, I have two rules, basically. First rule is don't do anything you don't want to do. If I find you breaking that rule, you don't let us serve here again. Don't do anything you don't want to do. Really got it. Second rule is do things you want to do. But if somebody asks you to do something you don't want to do it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. If I find out later that you did, you're out. You can't come back because I can't trust your. You, I can't trust that you manage your consent. So servers would come. In, they would just be all over the place, having fun, just being. What what was it that was uh, the, what is the draw for a server to perform in that way? Because it seems it's, this is literally a performance, and it sounds like yeah, people really appreciated the opportunity. Arguably, the dinner was for the servers more than it was for the guests, <laughs> and the motivation is going to vary by person. It's going to range from. I'm you know, like one of the servers may be pretty enough, like classically pretty enough that when she goes to a club, she just has guys all over her and here she can go, come here and be pretty and nobody's going to be doing that. Hmm. So she doesn't have to like try to keep people's hands off of her. Uh, it's a safe place to do that. There's other places, other women who, and men, I guess, who, There, there really aren't many places to explore being sexy. Like there was one guy who 
he came when he sh- and when he showed up his first time serving. He's he's he's, he's a stunningly handsome man, like, like classically stunning, handsome man, and he just couldn't find how to be that. Hmm. And you know, he was awkward in his motions. He was not graceful. And I've actually done this with a few. And I said, okay, and pulled him aside. I said, okay, it looks like you're feeling f- pretty awkward. He was like, yeah, this is really uncomfortable. I said, okay, yeah, I understand. I do understand. But I want you to do your best to be James Bond. Be the most far out James Bond you can be. And he started doing that and he was like oh snap this is crazy i can i actually like feel like me now like well you know you get to find yourself now Hmm. you get to find that peace because there's no like you you can't go to a restaurant well you can't go to a sporting event perhaps and explore that what did that mean to him be the be the James Bond, like well, like, I guess he didn't start shooting people, but he, he no, the, he didn't. The, but what 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 were those words? What did that? What did those words sort of invoke from him? Was it a confidence? He changed. Or? He changed how he walked, and he instead of being kind of like slumped, he was much more mm. up. So I don't know which James Bond he was trying mm. to emulate, <laughs> uh, but. He went from being a little bit dorky to a little bit graceful. Mm. And his hands stopped doing yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, like when you're carrying a bowl of soup, it's just like you don't want to be shaken. You want to be no. like chill. And Rock steady. He, he, yeah. So that's worked a few times with guys. With with women, I've said, you know, try being Mae West or Catherine Hepburn. That, that, t- that tends to resonate. Hmm. Uh, depending on who it is in a way these experiences can be life-changing it's um yeah so one of my favorite vignettes or or anecdotes is i'm this is five six years ago and there's this lady i'm guessing somewhere like late 20s early 30s and this is a we've got i've got 20 to 24 covers or Plates. Each person sitting at a table is called a cover. So I've got 20 to 24 covers to send out, and I have to send them all at the same time. It's not like a restaurant where you're doing four to five covers every few minutes. So every time I'm doing a course, I'm just full on, just crazy. And everyone helping me in the kitchen is doing the same thing. And I'm in the middle of, I think, doing prepping Maine, which is always the most intense. And I hear, Chef! I look up, and there's there she is, looking at me. And I, yeah, not right now. She's like, Chef! Okay, what? And she looks at me, and she said, something like four years ago, I was raped. And I completely shut off all of my sexuality after that. And tonight, for the first time, I can feel it again. Hmm. And she looked at me and she said, thank you. I said, well, you're welcome. But go thank them. She's like, yes. <laughs> and so she rushes out back into the room. And that's bringing tears to my eyes again. Hmm. Um, I didn't set out to provide an arena for people to have that opportunity, but she took that opportunity and she ran and God bless her for doing it. Hopefully she retained that sense of freedom and expanded it. I don't think I ever saw her again, which is too bad for me. But if she found her freedom and ran with it, then my life has meaning. Is that, if we go back to the first question of why do you do what you do, is, is this getting close to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it's 
hard to get through life without doing some maybe questionable activities, you know, things that may have been like working for companies that may have been vaguely harmful for the environment or culture of the world. Like, not that I worked for Shell, but, you know, something like that. Uh, I've never done anything in my life that was unequivocally, unequivocally good, wherein how I measure that is people's response is, oh my God, I feel alive now. And nobody's done, nobody's coerced me, nobody's tricked me. There's not been any workshop or drugs <laughs> or both. And I still, people still, well, not this last year, but people would still prior to that out in public, like introduce me, like this is the guy that saved my marriage, which isn't true, by the way. It's not false. But it's not. It's it's more accurate to say I provided them a place to change their viewpoint about themselves mm. and to change their behavior. They are the ones who took that new path. I didn't take them on the path. I created them for them a place yeah. to make that choice. Well, they also had it. You know, the, the wherewithal or the. the curiosity or bravery to to buy the ticket yeah you know and and, and buy the ticket together and and go well, in there and mo yeah most of the time it's the it's the woman in the in the in the couple that oh. is the driving force to do this thing almost all of the publicity we've gotten has been word of mouth from women telling other women which i love well, and, and okay, I can't call myself fully American anymore. I'm, I'm lost in the Atlantic. But I, th I think in Western culture, it is um, difficult to have this kind of conversation, I think, between two guys without being called perverts or, or, or you know. So if, if you're just out there saying, hey, come to this, you know, sexy, sexy dinner, you know, I think you have to have a certain... Like there's certain guy friends that I have that I would not broach that topic with because it would mm -hmm. instantly go into the locker room. And then there's other groups that you would say, hey, you know, and they would give me enough time to hear where I'm, my energy is when, when I'm talking about it. And I think if, you know, to do that at scale, I think it's really hard for, I, I find really hard for men just to, to also talk about sensuality and sexuality well, you're also talking words. to the guy. Yeah. I, I agree with you kind of abstractly, but I live in San Francisco, and that's not really been an issue here in San Francisco mm -hmm. in any of the time that I've been here. Uh, I mean, I lived in Idaho for a little while, and I wouldn't talk about anything other than mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was the only safe topic. <laughs> I'm sure someone could pervert may mayonnaise, though. But, um, but yeah, looking, looking back... Looking back to the experience, um, I also was. I, I'm curious how is how is Beth involved, or is there a stage manager? Because the description you gave is quite um, factual and linear. I'm curious, like w w music design, w w what odors were going on? You know, how, how crafted or staged was this, or was this really just you know setting out? all the toys, if you will, or all, all the pieces of the chessboard and then let the, let, let the game play itself. How, how did you well, like puppet master those, this? Those, those, not, those two options are not exclusive. They are inclusive of each other. Uh, the process of picking the right chess pieces is something that Beth was definitely involved in. Um, she did most of the music, for example. She did a lot of the ambiance. Uh, she did a lot of the guiding, training, working with the servers, and sometimes even running the servers, frequently even running servers. Sometimes she was a server. Uh, another valid kind of creation story on this was Beth was talking with me, and she said that she 
wanted a place where she could perform that wasn't a club scene. And she knew of other friends of hers who also wanted a place that they could perform and not have to worry about the ramifications of the performance. So it's, there are a lot of details we could have gotten into that we hadn't gotten into, um, partly constrained by the space that we're in, because it does inform a lot of those kind of which pieces you go with kind of thing. Um, but we've got kind of silk trimmings on the windows and light muslin curtain type things and beautiful tables and nice silverware and dishes and that. And the, this, the, the smells and stuff like that are going to come from the kitchen. Because one of the instructions for the servers is don't wear cologne or perfume. Um, and if I can smell the cologne or perfume, you're going to go take a shower. Um, is we want people to smell the food, and we want people to smell each other. And the two really work well together. Uh, the music we picked was mostly uh, like electro swing kind of stuff, 1920s remix stuff, uh, with some blues and some add-ons on top of that. I really there's a band uh, out of Germany and or Switzerland called Yellow, and I wanted to use a bunch of that, but it didn't play well, sadly. But uh, like the Rhythm Divine song that they did was one of the songs I used as an inspiration. Um, just kind of looking around the space, which is messy right now because we've got five people living here. It was, it was really put the pieces on the board and let them play out. Um, and it always worked, which was fascinating. I mean, it didn't seem to matter who was here. It always worked. It was, it was trippy. Even if it looked like, oh God, it's going to be a disaster. It always, once Maine went down, the room would switch. It, it always happened. Sometimes well, a little bit before. Why? What, what, what do you think was the... the I don't know. Why? I've been to, I've, I've been a guest twice in, in the 10 years we did it. Because um, <clears throat> finding somebody to run the kitchen was challenging. Um, and I knew it was happening. Was gonna, I'd seen it so many times. And it's, I don't know what, I don't know why what happens happens. And worse, I don't know how to describe what happens as like the what of what happens. I can use an analogy, uh, but I don't understand enough about humans to be able to say, oh, well, you know, such and such hormone was released or such and such pheromone was released by a certain number of people and that created a, I don't know any of that nonsense. But I can tell you it's as if we don't do this. It's as if we gave everybody ecstasy when they came in the door and it all kicks in at the same time. It's, it's like that in the room. And I don't understand how that happens reliably and predictably hmm. every single time with different players in the room each time. Because I've been in rooms where that hasn't happened. So I know it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Maybe some of these things are better not understood. Um, no, I disagree. I completely disagree. You want to know? <laughs> well, I think humanity ought to know. Because yeah. mm. if, like, if there is a conflict, for example, and I don't know that I, we could use this as a way to manage conflict, but I, if you look back in history, there are lots and lots of s statesmen who said things like, I won't negotiate until I had a meal with a person. Hmm. There's a lot of that kind of stuff where until we've shared bread, we can't find common ground. So there is, there is that as a precedent. Um, but if 
there was a way to not coerce people to be happy, but give them an opportunity to be happy in ways that we don't routinely get. Why not make that available as a thing in the world? God knows we've come up with all kinds of ways to be shitty to each other. Well, I, I just speaking off the top of my head, um, because that, you know, I don't want to do something with someone until you've, you've had a meal with them in, in corporate land, at least over here in, in Europe. Oftentimes when, when people are having a conflict, I send someone to that country to have a beer or wine with the person. So it's a different thing. And so if you mm -hmm. can sit down with someone and see them as a human, mm -hmm. um, what I'm imagining is, you know, if I was in that experience, it's probably a, and I don't have any notes, but it's probably something much more hormonal than like you're talking about, but that we have all of these masks or shields that we're walking through life. Normally, even in your closest relationships, you have these personalities that you built, which are not really yourself. And I, and I would imagine um, being in an experience where um, it's more allowed to be truly yourself. And then that sort of emboldens you a bit. Um, You're using language that I don't necessarily agree with. Okay. Go, well, uh, I, yeah. I don't know that I've ever been anything other than myself. Yeah. And the masks which is language I don't use, would just be a part of me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I see many people who suffer, as I do and did, in, in, and I'm talking particularly professional, maybe personal, I don't know, but professional. I'm going to try and get or, it better. Yeah, it you, better. You've been slowly becoming one with the light there. Um, <laughs> where people who are... are um, for one reason or another, it's remaining in, in, again, professional roles, which completely don't fit them, their, their inner self, I, I feel. And so every day, in, in, in and out, every day, are behaving in a way which is based on expectations of others. And that is who they are. So that is part of what they have chosen to be. Yet it also takes a huge amount of energy to maintain that. And then therefore you have burnout and depression and all these other consequences of life where, um, and those so are parts, I, those are parts of them. So if you want to go down into a sort of a parts philosophy, different parts of a person around their self, uh, you know, I, I can mm -hmm. resonate with that. Um, and sometimes these parts maybe just don't, don't serve them. And they, and they, and they remain in situations where these, these, masks or parts or dimensions are, 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 are not allowing them to shine. So I'm, 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 I guess I'm just dreaming that maybe that place is a, a where people can move beyond those parts. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to. The language you're using is, is stuff that I've explored in my life, given, I mean, I live in San Francisco. <laughs> it's hard not to explore mm -hmm. your true self or your authentic self kind of conversations. Uh, when I started digging deeply into behavioral psychology is when I started to discount that conversation. Mm. Uh, because those conversations presume the existence of something that we've never found, which is that inner self. Uh, but we have seen and found behavior. Uh, uh, I'm comfortable with the mystery. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be fun if we found a way to uh, untangle it. I don't think it'll be me who will untangle it. But, um, when, for example, it, kind of on a tangent, but when I've moved from one country to another, one significantly different culture to another, who I consider myself to be changed. And I think that's a function of the change in behavior more than who I am has got a chance to flourish. For me, my, as I've lived in many cultures as well, as, as you have, I think my, my perspective changed before my behavior changed. Um, and those two things sort of went hand in hand. Um, we do think that. Yeah. This is true. We do think that. 
Yeah, I, well, I'm, su- I'm suspicious of that thought because <laughs> I uh, also think that, yeah. and I am also suspicious of that thought yeah. in me. It is we're a, a long know, ways from the dinners. Well, it is well, we are and we're not because you know the the you um, joyfully and playfully create a space for for a group of people to behave differently and yes. And comfortably. And so I think these or these... a chance to explore the inner self. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go there. Yeah. So um, now something, uh, Chris, that, that you wrote in an email recently has given me a cause for concern that you said that um, these experiences, and this is available at our gourmet life.com. Mm-hmm may not survive the pandemic. And so I am curious on why something so beautiful could not survive the pandemic. What's, what's the thinking there? So it's what February 1st to 2021. Uh, So those of you who are watching this thing, 15 years in the future or whenever uh, there's no evidence today that this pandemic is going to end anytime soon. Um, The vaccines that we have available on the market don't stop transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2. It does have some impact on our susceptibility individually to COVID-19, but it doesn't stop transmissibility. And right now the big deal is to stop transmissibility. Uh, If we can stop transmissibility, then, in theory, the number of mutations will diminish. And one of the big concerns right now is that there will be a new strain that is A, uh, more resistant to the vaccines and thus more deadly, and B, more transmissible. And we're already seeing strains that are more transmissible. Um, So until this particular pandemic uh, not necessarily has ended, but has resolved. As in, I can put 40 people in a room and not kill two of them, one or two of them. Um, that's bad. <laughs> That'd be bad. That'd just be bad. It's not, uh, it's not a, a risk I want to take. I know there's quite friends of mine that are taking those risks. They're going to parties now. And most of them end up with COVID. So uh, where I'm sitting now, there's no evidence that this thing is going to end soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like how long can, I just, and if outside of COVID-19, the dinners lost money. The events lost money every year. It wasn't a lot of money. We're talking ten, twenty thousand dollars a year. So this amount of money that it really lost, but that meant that money was coming out of my savings, and the pandemic has zeroed out my savings. So I don't. There is no buffer or mm-hmm. uh, well to pull water out of right now. So for the dinner to resume there there would need to be some things in place and none of those things are obviously available right now sadly yeah so it's not a never it's it's when it's resolved which we don't know when that might be it's it's not a never but it's also i don't see so there's like there's front of the hand, back of hand kind of thing, front of coin, back of coin. There's on one hand there's opportunity and poss- the opportunity for something to happen. The other hand is possibility. So there definitely is the, the possibility of the dinner, mm. and I can see that, but I don't see the opportunity of it. I don't see where, like for example, that cash is coming from. I think it's not coming from the U.S. government. <laughs> they will. That's not something they're going to fund. Mm. And to, to do this, we're going to have to find, I would like to find a new venue, a different venue. So, um, one, for example, that is ADA compliant and this space is not. 
Americans with Disabilities Act. So, so yes, um, we could somebody in a wheelchair, for example, uh, couldn't get up here, and that's yeah. that's too bad. I, it, that it it pains me to acknowledge that I can't support ADA because I I think it ought to be supported. Mm. My sister, my sister in law, for example, is in a wheelchair, and I can't serve her dinner here. And that's sad. So I, what I'm what I'm thinking is as people are are watching or listening to this, <clears throat> and if you go to ourgourmetlife.com and, and read about it, um, I'm 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 really curious if people have ideas on on um, how to keep this thing going. I, you know I, I don't know I know I know that the pandemic sort of ebbs and flows by by culture. Um, Meaning right now it's kind of a thing to go to Antwerp and go for shopping weekends because the Netherlands is shut down. You have to really question the wisdom of that. Um, and so, so I didn't having, know they were doing that. Yeah, having having something uh, bounce around simply because you can doesn't sound smart either. Um, right. Having having something that that um, if you did it in a in a COVID proof way, so like uh, plastic tubes around everyone. I guess it would sort of impact the whole atmosphere. Um, it would. And you know, like, I've had people contact me with like um, scubas, uh, like the breathing apparatus that you, yeah. yeah uh, and you, know, you, you can carry about 20 minutes yeah. of air on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that it just seems, I don't know how you eat that way though. Because hmm. as soon as you open your mouth, you're exposed. Yeah. Um, so we did try to do the dinners over uh, Zoom. Well, not Zoom, but something like Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and it it was cute, but it did not produce the result. And it's really hard to have that human contact, yeah. which was which was a constituent part of the experience. Was uh, if you opted, if as a guest you consented to being touched above the waist by the server then that would routinely happen it would you know it would be like a kiss on the cheek or um, a, a light rubbing on the arm or a, a quick like, shoulder massage and we're not talking actually overtly sexual activities but it was physical contact and obviously we can't do that right now sadly it makes me sad because that is what humanity needs right now, togetherness and, and contact and care and love. So, um, I mean, there are ways to do it. It would, um, I know if somebody said, okay, if money was no object and you want, and we want to do a dinner, how do we do it? I'm like, I, I know how to do it. I know how to do it safely. I just don't think anybody's willing to do it. Well, self quarantine for two weeks somewhere. Nope. Not self quarantine. You have to be under a supervised quarantine. Yeah. It has to be safe. So I would need to yeah. buy a re retreat center or, or a hotel somewhere. Right. And pe people move in. They're there for three weeks. They go through three negative tests. And then all the servers and all the staff go through that also. everyone. I mean, this is roughly consistent with what U.S. sports teams have done, as yeah. an example, where they, you know, they create that, that bubble, that container that holds them so they can all interact with each other safely. And you just you maintain a very very strict boundary. But who wants to spend twenty thirty thousand dollars for a dinner, which is what it would cost? Because you have to support a whole bunch of people for an indefinite period of time. What would it cost per person? Well, I don't know how much would it cost to be in a well tended in a hotel for three weeks, mm. you know, isolated, you know, the, you, and the tests themselves are hundred bucks, two hundred yeah. bucks a piece. So, you know, you're talking thousands of dollars per person just to get in the door. <laughs> and then you get a shoulder massage and then you're out again. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be willing to, I'm going to go on a limb and say that most people who are going to spend that amount of money want a bit more than a shoulder rub. And that's, that's not the industry I'm in. <laughs> um, I don't know, you might be surprised. You might be surprised because I think with, with, with the, the, 
just the shit, you know, existence that so many people have been through to have an opportunity to go be part of something, you know, because a lot of people are working from home anyways. They could work from a hotel. I don't, I don't know. I'm saying, you know, there's there's a possibility here. So and I love that you've been thinking about it. So, And my son is a doctor and I've got friends who have contacts in China because when they, when they do a lockdown, they do things similar to this. Um, it's pretty draconian and it has to be supervised. Uh, US, like I said, in the US, some of the sports networks have been doing this. It's, so it's not unheard of, it's just, it's expensive. Mm. Uh, and there has to be a rationale to, for doing it other than you know, the shoulder rub, I think. I don't know. If somebody calls it's, me up and says, I've not, got the money to spend. It's not only a shoulder rub, it's, it's a shoulder rub and your soup. It's true. It's amazing. I can do some amazing soup. Um, I can do. I, I can do. I can do a good soup. It's true. I, I think let's just you know, in the art of the possible, um, there's some nutty people that I know that may be listening to this that have some you know cash in their pocket to to uh, fund something that I believe would at least be break even because. Those that can, you know, for example, have jobs they can re re do remotely, they're, they're not going on holidays. You know, there's right. um, a son of a friend of mine here has created, a, 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 can't call it a Corona proof, but a, a, a Corona, a, a holiday that rich people can go on in, in this time where they get on a private jet in Amsterdam, fly somewhere in Europe, um, the son's group brings a couple RVs there, completely sanitizes them, um, you know, whether it's, you know, medically sanitized, but they do the best they can. This rich family goes around and does their things, come back and gets on their private jet and flies back. And those kind of things are happening more and more. So there's, there's um, whether you can call that safe or not, but those are within the bounds of risk that people seem to be taking. So there's, I don't know, there's, there might be something there. So what I would really yeah. suggest is on your website, is there a newsletter sign-up-y thing? Yes, there is there at the is. bottom of the page. Bottom of the page. So I would invite people, if you are interested in such an experience, either now or after the pandemic is resolved, to go to yeah. ourgourmetlife.com our and sign up for the newsletter. And then who knows, maybe uh, to a scientifically sealed compound <laughs> near you there could be an interesting experience or wherever this because this type of experience will happen again for me it's just a question of yeah it's, when and where it, it'll definitely happen again um as long as there's interest and i'm alive uh, mm. primarily because i get to be at the back of the room looking at the guests who are blissed out of their minds, hmm. knowing that I just created happiness and there is no argument, there's no discussion. Those people are happy. Like those people are fucking happy. And I don't have a lot of places in my life where I could I could stand before God and say, Yes, I created happiness. Hmm. And there's no argument there. And uh I used to work with a guy who, who he and I would have what he called or come to Jesus conversations. It's like, defend yourself now. You know, given what you've been doing for the last six months, defend what you've done. You know, have you been a contribution to humanity or are you just another carbon sink? And most of you know, I was just another carbon sink. <laughs> yeah. But now, finally, <clears throat> I've... There are now thousands and thousands of people who've been touched in ways that, sadly, is unique on this planet, as far as I can tell. I've heard rumors of things, but I've not mm. actually seen them. And I know a few people who've tried to do things that are similar, and they haven't gotten off the ground. I've even told people, I will happily help you reproduce this wherever you are, if you contact me. I'll tell you all my secrets. Can they use and play with your cock when they do that? Or do they have to provide their own cock? Um, 
if they're here and they're uh, they've had they've gone through three negative tests, yes, they can <laughs> they can they can play with my eighteen inch bronze cock. And if they're if they're very sweet, and, yeah. um, buy me dinner first, then we can have a different conversation. Well, um, Chris Hubbard, again as part of the what's becoming the family series. Um, mm-hmm. I've thoroughly enjoyed this because as I shared at the beginning, you know, I was there under a completely different situation, you know, uh, family reunion with children all over the place. And yeah, Thanksgiving. I, I, yeah, I noticed the, there's a lot of even pictures missing from the walls and stuff. And, and I heard a little bit of what happens, but I was like, so, something happens here. And um, mm-hmm. I'm delighted to uh, get a little bit of a peek behind the, uh, I guess the, the the Wizard of Oz uh, drapes there of what's you know what's what's going on. Um, I think there for people who are interested again our gourmet life and you know there's a newsletter there you can sign up. So when things become you know mm-hmm. Corona resolved, I like that differentiation there. Um, and if people have ideas, meaning if if there's communities or people who who say hell yeah you know this is something that we can do, then. Um, you know, I, I, there's Chris cool. who ha- has a, a bit of a uh, um, a recipe for this. We could do this in New Zealand, for example. Yeah. We could totally do this in New Zealand all day long, because they've kept themselves clean. Yeah, but I don't know that though. I don't know that New Zealand will let me into their country, <laughs> given that I'm coming from the states. Well, yeah, maybe not. Maybe that's part of. <laughs> maybe that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But I, something's <clears throat> going to happen at some point. So. Mr. Hubbard, um, or as you mentioned, people call you in the kitchen, Sir Asshole. It has been a mm-hmm. pleasure. Um, yes. Thank you so much. And I would, um, again, urge people go to ourgourmetlife.com. Sign up for the newsletter for, for news on if and how and when this, this, this comes back. Thank you. It's been delightful chatting with you. Learn more at ebullion.com slash podcast.